Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, just wait for one or two more people to come in from the waiting room. Welcome back to Penn's workshop in the history of material text, which was founded, as you know, by Peter Stalybrass in 1993, which puts us in our 28th year this year. So uh, we were just talking, it's been one of the unexpected minor solaces of the pandemic that we've been able to see many people each week who otherwise wouldn't be able to join us. And, and I'm pleased to welcome some new faces this week as well. Um, if you're not on our listserv, uh, you can sign up on our website or I'll put the link in the chat. If you'd like to sign up for our listserv, you'll just get one announcement uh, or so each week of the upcoming talk and it'll um, will be on Zoom in the spring as well. So you'll get the links for that. I'm Zach Lesser. I'm uh, one of the organizers of the workshop. I'm in the English department at Penn, I'm joined by John Pollock, who is um, curator in the Kislak Center. Hey, everybody. And Jerry Singerman, who's humanities editor at the Penn Press. Hello, everybody. Good to see you. And our Bristol Schoenberg Fellow in the History of Material Text, Philip Mogan, who manages everything about the seminar. Hey, everyone. So next week is our final workshop of the semester um, featuring Priya Joshi, who will talk about decolonizing archives. But we'll be back in the spring with another great lineup. So watch for that announcement in the near future. And tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Thomas Conlon, who is Professor of East Asian Studies and History at Princeton. His work explores how processes such as warfare or ritual performance determine the politics, ideals, and social matrix of Japan from the 10th through 16th century. His first book, In Little Need of Divine Intervention, Scrolls of the Mongol Invasions of Japan, uh, also included reproductions and translations of picture scrolls commissioned by a Japanese warrior against the Mongols. Of interest to our group, I note that the Amazon page for the book includes a warning for the unwary. Please note that the entire book was intentionally printed from back to front so that the reproduced scrolls unfold in Japanese order from right to left. Thus, the book's spine is on the right. Uh, and I really like the combination of the correct right to left Japanese order but still saying that it's printed from back to front uh, for the, as if it's, all, it's both correct and incorrect at the same time. Um, Professor Conlon is also the author of State of War, The Violent Order of 14th Century Japan, along with A General History of the Samurai and his most recent book, From Sovereign to Symbol, An Age of Ritual Determinism in 14th Century Japan, which uh, deals with medieval Japanese political thought. And tonight he'll speak about the transmission of omission, understanding, Japan, understanding Japan's 14th to 15th centuries through altered histories. Please welcome Tom Kama. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zachary, for that fine introduction. And also thank you, Philip, for all your help and preparation. And, uh, and, and John and Jeremy and everyone, I really, I'm delighted to be here. I wish it could be here in person, but uh, I hope to have the opportunity to, to uh, meet you in meet you all again in person sometime. Um, maybe I'll just, maybe I'm just gonna try to share my screen right now. Uh, okay, can you see? I think it's, sorry. We could see the whole, is it on the whole screen? Everything look good? Okay. So, um, uh, so, so what I wanted to do for today is I'm, I'm going to introduce you two important war tales of, of uh, medieval Japan. Um, and I don't expect that most of you um, have ever heard of these texts. Um, and, and the first is called the Tai Heikir, the Record of Great Pacification. And it recounts the wars of the 14th century. And that's the one in red that you can see. Um, and then the other one, the, the darker text is called the Chronicle of the Wars of Onin, and it provides uh, a narrative of wars which lasted from 1467 through 1477. Um, and that's, that's in case you wonder there, Japan has different era names and Onin is an, is, is an era name and it, it, it's for those years in the 1460s. So I'm gonna first talk about the Taiheiki and then I'll, I'll, I'll switch to this Chronicle of Onin. 
Um, and, and I must admit, I have a love-hate relationship with the Taiheike because it's been a crucial source for my research for over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, it was a, for when I wrote uh, State of War, which was my dissertation, uh, I relied heavily on, on the uh, Taiheike. Um, and, um, and actually, my sovereign the symbol here, um, that I, uh, for that, um, I wanted to create a, a narrative, a political narrative that was not bound by the Taiheke. Um, and so I actually thought of it as kind of an anti-Taiheke text um, in that I want to rehabilitate figures that this tale doesn't really talk about. Um, and as far as uh, the second tale, the Chronicle of Onin, that's something that I've, I've really been working on uh, much more recently. And so uh, earlier this year, um, I did publish an article about prophecy and, and this text in the journal of Japanese Studies. And if you have the chance to look at it, I, I welcome your, your comments. Uh, so, so let me provide an overview of each text, its significance, and in particular how omissions shaped histories as much as what was written in them per se. And that's the theme really of my talk today. Now, the, the, uh, the Taiheiki, or the Chronicle of, of Great Pacification, uh, recounts a civil war that was fought in Japan's 14th century between uh, proponents of a northern court and their generals, the Ashikaga, and a southern court. Uh, and so let me provide a very basic narrative of this war, because it really is, is helpful for us to understand, the, the, to situate this text. Um, so you have uh, one emperor named Godaigo. Um, and he resented the autonomy and power of Japan's warriors. Um, and so what he did is he started a war which killed many of these warriors. Um, and one general, and this is a person named Ashikaga Takauji, um, first supported Godaigo, uh, but ultimately disturbed by Godaigo's absolutism, Takauji rebelled against the emperor and set up a rival on the throne. Um, and these rivals became known as Northern Emperors, and I'm not going to really name them, but just, uh, uh, but I just thought I'd mention that. Um, Godaigo did not give up, um, and he fled to the south, and that's where he became known as the Southern Emperor, and he founded a Southern Court. Uh, and wars between the Ashikaga and the Southern Court lasted from approximately 1333 to 1392. Uh, Takuji um, uh, won let me go back. Um, he won these wars, uh, basically, um, and, uh, um, uh, and the Southern Court was ultimately defeated in 1392. Uh, but for, for the purpose of this text, which is interesting, is that Takuji did not, wasn't alone, but he had a younger brother named Tadayoshi, which you can see here, um, and the two of them were, were a team, and they were so successful that by 1350, it really looked like um, the Ashikaga would win this war easily. But unfortunately, there was a succession dispute, things became nasty, and we end up seeing a three-way power struggle between Kodaigo's forces, Tadayoshi's forces, and Takuji's forces. Um, and so in the 1350s, it was an absolute political chaos um, until ultimately um, Ashikaga Takuji uh, won. Uh, and so, so really then this context is really important to understand the Taiheiki. Uh, the Taiheiki is, is a semi-public history. It consists of 40 volumes. Um, and so I could stop the share screen, but if you could look at the picture of me, this is one little short version of it. So you can sort of see how many tech, how, how large this is with the 40 volumes. Um, and actually maybe I will stop the share. So I wanna show you, um, I brought one text in. And so, so when I talk about 40 volumes, like they're all, they all could be printed here, but I wanted to give you one volume. Here's an 18th century version of this text. Um, and so this would be, this is actually two vol. when I talk about volumes, this is what it looked like in the original printed text, as it were. Um, and what I, I was able to find volumes 21 and 22, the Taiheiki. Remember those numbers because it, it will come back. Um, so, so anyways, um, so, so that's, that's what we have. And, and the Taiheiki is a very, very long text. Um, so much so that um, there's a Japanese word called Taihen, which means grueling. And so some people joke that it's not, it shouldn't be called the Taiheiki, it should be called Taihenki or like the grueling, terrible to read, awful long text. Um, so let me come back uh, to this. Um, and the Taiheiki roughly covers from the years 1320. Can you, can you all see the text, the, the screen? Okay, okay, that's good. Um, and uh, one contemporary, there was a general named Imogawa Ryoshin who lived from 1326 to 1420, and he famously complained about the Taiheiki. Uh, and he wrote as follows, he says, the Taiheiki is full of distortions, 
in lies. Um, and he wrote how, um, it, for example, that, that this idea that Ashikaga Takuji had surrendered to, to Godaigo um, was something which was absurd. Here, here's again the picture of Takuji. Um, and he went on to write, the author must not have known what really happened and resorted to speculation. He was a fool. The packet passages should be deleted. Although Roshan's critiques are well known, the original passages he complained about are not. Um, and, and, and what's interesting is that everything he criticized in the Taiheiki is no longer found in that text. Uh, Roshun continued with his critique as follows. He said, the Taiheiki is riddled throughout with errors and fabrications of old. A monk from the temple of Hoshoji first presented the works more than 30 volumes to Tadayoshi. Um, and Tadayoshi had, had this monk read it out to him. It had many, its many flaws and errors moved Tadayoshi um, to, to, um, to say, as far as I could see, this work contains an extraordinary number of errors. Uh, additions and cuts are required. In the meantime, it cannot be allowed to circulate. The work therefore became unavailable. Joshin mentioned how Tadayoshi listed to more than 30 volumes of the Taiheiki, but the, all the current versions of the text, Tadayoshi dies in volume 26. Thus, as a result of the criticism by Tadayoshi and Yoshun, we know that much was, in, was sort of omitted from this early text. Now, I'm not going to go into the factional politics of, um, of 14th century Japan, but as I had talked about before, um, in 1350, the brothers Ashikaga Takauji, who was Japan's shogun and, and military leader, um, and his brother Tadayoshi went from being allies to mortal enemies. Um, thus, they represented two competing political factions, with the third being the rival Southern Court. The, the two brothers, I'm not going to talk about the Southern Court, but the two brothers really represented competing ideals. Tadayoshi was a strict legalist, while Takauji was a free wheeling general. Um, as Tadayoshi, uh, he could be documented as overseeing and presumably editing the Taiheiki, he was much more involved in laws and these, these literary works. Unsurprisingly, the Taiheiki praises Tadayoshi for his good governance. Um, Tadayoshi disliked extravagance and the bestowing of gifts, but his brother Takauji, um, and most of his followers did not share this attitude. Uh, although criticisms in the Taiheiki of Takuji are muted, um, figures closely allied to him, certain generals and all that, are described as being flamboyant and extravagant. And there's a term called basara, which means extravagant person, which is actually has a pejorative thing. And what's interesting in the Taiheiki is that term is only used to describe Takauji partisans. Thus, uh, I, I think that it's what is this term is, has uh, been used by scholars to describe a culture phenomenon and distorted our understanding of warrior culture in Japan. This was not flamboyance, wasn't just an attitude that these people liked. It was something which is used just to sort of critique certain political rivals. Um, and, and you can only understand it if you know the nature of the politics of where the Taiheiki fits in there. The Taiheiki reached its fine, and, and this is actually a picture of a general, it's called, it was supposed to be Basara, and you could see that sort of the tiger skin um, for his quiver and, and uh, for his, you know, the sword scabbard and all those other things. Um, the Taiheiki reached its final form in the 1370s, um, and it would seem that the text stabilized to 40 volumes around this time, um, and an important official named Hosokawa Yoriyuki um, read over it, and this is around 1370s, and he was displeased with the 22nd volume of the revised text, and he famously burned all copies of, this, of the 22nd volume of this manuscript. Um, in his case, the book burning proved successful as the content of volume 22 was completely lost. Um, nevertheless, later copies of the Taiheiki would be reorganized and renumbered so that, like I said, I have the copy of volume 22, it's actually an amalgamation of the old volumes 21 and 23 of the text. Uh, so, so and, and, and what's also interesting is that uh, Hosokawa Yoriyuki oversaw the completion of the text. Um, and here's the end, which famously ends with its praise of none other than Hosokawa Yoriyuki. Um, and his editing is pretty clear because uh, the, the very end of the text states that um, uh, none straight above Yoriyuki's words of future, virtue, but followed his orders and the civilized realm uh, was most gloriously at peace. And what's interesting, actually, they, they use a the word chuka or, or zhonghua, which in, often refers to China. Um, but in this case, the text is, is using that to refer to Japan as being the civilized realm and sort of the center of, of the world. Um, and the ending is more ironic, though, uh, because under Yoriyuki's watch, the wars had not ended. Uh, and so Hosokawa's Yoriyuki's omissions, the books he burned, 
were not transmitted. And in this sense, this is where the past became unrecoverable, but the abrupt end of the text and the omission of the wars that continue for 20 more years has given the, the perception that um, the wars were, were sort of more indeterminate than they actually were. Now I wanted to turn to the next omission. Um, and in this case, the Taiheki, the, the, there's, um, uh, it's not about, uh, it's about how the, um, the text was read and not what was written in the text. Um, and so, so I want to talk about in, in the, um, it became in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, an extremely important didactic history, sort of a textbook uh, for warriors. And here's, here's a printed version. And the one I showed you before is, is really of that time. There are very many copies of this text at that time. Um, and, and this text became used by a lot of warriors because it was thought to show what was loyal behavior. Um, and it became uh, so, so important that um, I would say that the, the attitudes, the, the sort of discussions of, of loyal warriors, um, particularly certain figures, uh, profoundly influenced Japanese history and Japanese attitudes in later times. Um, and so, and there are a number of, of editions. Um, a lot of versions have been printed. And if I were at my office, I could show you a whole bunch of those editions, but, uh, but I don't have them here. Uh, but it, but it's uh, what what I find that's, that's quite interesting is that that the Taiheke readers they could not read this whole forty volume text um, and still instead they had to you know select certain episodes which proved popular um, and so they would read certain particular highlights of the tale um, and I, I should add that that Hosokawa Yoriyuki's conclusion for example was never particularly favored um, and so uh, so you don't see much reading of that um, and the narratives of the Ashikaga brothers proved so complex and fraught um, and their, their histories were so ambivalent that they were not particularly popular subjects as well. Instead, certain lesser figures that are mentioned at Taiheki became the most important and prominent. Um, one of those um, is a, you can see these statues of him here. Um, there was a, a, a general who fought for the Southern court um, named Kusunoki Masashige. Um, and he became popular and, and he, I mean, originally because he fought against the Ashikaga in their northern court, he had been branded a criminal or an enemy of the court um, in, back in 1336. But in 1559, um, actually him, sort of his family, um, they were actually specifically pardoned by the emperor. So it shows you by the 1550s, already this, this sort of myth about this figure was, was, was becoming more prominent. And so he, he was pardoned. Um, and this is due to, um, uh, I would say that less from uh, the, the fame of the Taiheki, the politics, but there, there is sort of a weakening of the Ashikaga regime at this time. And so people are looking for new sort of heroes and all that. And, uh, um, and, and what I, I would say is that um, Masashige is a person who sort of really stands out. And what he did, he actually doesn't show up in this tale a whole lot. Um, he was a prominent warrior in the 1330s. Um, and at a key moment, he advised the Emperor Godaigo not to engage in a, um, uh, a decisive battle. He said, you would definitely lose and the Ashikaga will win. Uh, Godaigo didn't listen to him. Um, and so what happened was is that he just still followed Godaigo, went to battle, uh, fought bravely, was killed. Um, and, uh, um, and that's the end of Kusunoki Masashige. Um, and, and I think one reason why he was praised is because there was no effort for him to sort of change sides or all that, like a lot of these other warriors would do. And he, he becomes sort of lauded as, as a hero and in the 19th century and particularly into the 20th century. Um, and and what is, what's, what's quite remarkable is that um, right before his defeat, um, is that uh, he said, he said, uh, Kusunoki basically resolved to re be reborn seven times to fight and die for the emperor. Um, and, um, and so that's, and then he did kill himself. And so if you look, you have the statue, and then there's this little saying down here, which basically says, you know, uh, uh, seven lives to avenge the emperor. So you can imagine in, you know, World War II and all of that, he was thought to be an exemplar of, you know, abiding by the imperial command and what have you. Um, and so what's, what's interesting though, is that in, it's sort of in more modern times when they're emphasizing this idea of undying loyalty, you can see where this episode becomes popular, but in a more Buddhist world, particularly in 14th century Japan, um, the, such a strong attachment to the world, such a strong attachment to sort of the politics was thought to be a negative thing. Um, and so if you read the original Taiheiki, 
what and and all the different versions are very consistent on that is that um, he Masashige does appear in the text in later times, um, but he appears as a tengu or a demon from hell, as it were. Um, and so there's this idea that because he had this sort of lingering attachment to politics in the world, that he didn't have, he wasn't able to release himself from the world, and therefore he was reborn as a demon. So if you were to read through the whole Taiki text, you would see that he becomes a malevolent spirit, which is the cause for a lot of disorder throughout throughout the century. Um, and, uh, and I think that also one other element, if you read the whole Taihiki, it's called the Chronicle of Great Pacification. And what is being pacified isn't just enemies of the court, but it's also the pacification of this sort of unruly spiritual world. Um, and so, so what I find really interesting is, is that in the later Tokugawa period, when these, these readers were, were, were giving a certain episode and they would just read the episode where Masashige resolves to live, uh, to die seven times for the emperor, they consciously ignore everything which betrays that loyalty in a very negative light. Uh, so this isn't really an omission in the text, but it's, 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 a, um, it's a, an omission in reading um, and which makes a villain uh, a hero um, and I think that's one of the, the most sort of subtle distortions of this work. Um, and, uh, and so one, one last thing is I wanted to sort of talk about, uh, touch on is the, the power of the Taiheiki and, and showing how it was used as a, his, a source of history in more recent times. Uh, and for all of its popularity as a literary source, the Taiheiki was, was sort of debated as, as whether it, it should be a um, historical of, of source or not. Um, and um, there, this was particularly relevant because in the early 20th century, um, a lot of Japanese historians tried to create what's called like the history of Great Japan, which is meant to be a chronological compilation of all the documents and all the literary sources. Now, one, one historian um, who is uh, named Kume Kunitake wrote a famous article about the Taiheiki, and he said the Taiheiki is useless as a historical source. Um, and he was right. Uh, because if you, uh, to cite one example, we know that Ashikaga Takuji first rebelled on, on 427-1333, but the Taiheiki has him coming down, like first rebelling some three weeks later. So in terms of chronology, in terms of accuracy, in terms of a lot of things, it becomes very clear that the Taiheiki is, is really quite a distortion. Uh, and although some historians uh, were, would say that the Taiheiki is, is fundamentally unreliable, um, they lost out in their arguments, um, and it was still included in this crucial compilation of sources. Um, but what's what's really interesting is that in this compilation, this chronological chronological compilation of sources, um, which unfortunately I don't have a volume here, but it's called the Dainihon Shiro, which is like the basic source for the time. The very first page opens with a passage from the Taiheiki. Um, and uh, but what's interesting is the editors knew that there were so many problems with the earlier. Um, Thunder um, earlier uh, uh, times that they they decided to start it relatively late. So after all the important events happened, and so it's it's that's when they they first then used the Taiheiki quote. And since then, um, in spite of the acknowledged problems, uh, scholars still will call the 14th century the age of Taiheiki. So so that's really where we are with that. So so to conclude my analysis of the Taiheiki. Um, I, I just first focused on how uh, it, it, the, the Taiheiki glorified one faction of the Ashikaga as lawgivers, um, and then it showed the other faction, the supporter of Ashikaga Takauji, um, were characterized as being flamboyant, iconoclastic individuals, um, and so that's the first bias. The second one is through the selective reading of um, negative sections uh, of the text and, and focusing on just a certain episodes, you start seeing the glorification of a person known as Kusunake Masushige. Um, and finally, um, I'd say that the selective quoting of the Taiheiki and omissions of part of it in historical compilations uh, has also to, to cause people to assume that this is a relatively reliable text when that really isn't, isn't the case. Um, so, so that's really our, where we are for, for just looking at the Taiheiki. So, so now I'd like to turn to the, the next great chronicle, as it were, and that's called the Chronicle of Oni. Um, and this text is actually um, uh, much shorter. It's only three volumes. Um, and, and I'm going to show that how omissions in the text um, resulted in the events it was purported to describe to become utterly confused. Um, and uh, so, so, and here again, I'll just sort of set up a very brief explanation here. 
uh, is that um, uh, you have um, it, the, the Ashkaga uh, established a, a warrior I'll just a warrior government um, which ruled in tandem with their court. Um, and the successors to Ashkaga Takauji, uh, they delegated a lot of power to generals that were known as daimyo. Um, the generals are able to secure a lot of revenue to create armies. Um, and so there's a great devolution of power into the provinces in the 15th century. Um, one inept leader is Ashkaga Yoshimasa. You can see him here. He kind of has a deer in the headlights look, even in a statue. Um, picked a fight with a lot of these regional warlords and they all attacked him. And this resulted in a long decade long, war, uh, sorry, a decade long war, um, which resulted in the destruction of Japan's capital. Um, and the war itself is called the Onin War, um, has been perceived as being incomprehensible. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Berry said that uh, the Onin signaled a, a change in Japan's historical experience, but one that could not be apprehended in terms of clear meanings and obvious directions. The Japanese historian uh, Sakurai Eiji um, basically admitted that he couldn't explain why the war arose nor why it continued for so long. Um, and most of understandings of the war are based on the Chronicle of Onin. Um, which I showed you before, which it, it was it was a text that was written around the year 1500, which described the events of 1467 to 77. Um, and an overview of this conflict is is very simple. This ter this this account says that Ashika Yoshimasa was very corrupt, um, and then you have the creation of two large factions. One is led by this Hosokawa Katsumoto, and the other one is Yamana Sozen. Um, and right before the war begins, you see a giant comet, um, and that's sort of a harbinger of war. Um, and the, these two commanders come in, they fight from 1467 to 1473, and then they both die, and that's the end of, of the conflict. Um, and the war continues for four more years, but it's really not covered in this tale. Um, the other thing which is kind of interesting is that there's, um, there's a term that's called gekokujo, which means the lower over overthrowing the higher. Um, and this is, this is a, a revolt from below. And that is something which, which is very prominent in, in these tales. Um, so, and what I believe, uh, again, is that um, omissions are, are crucial to our understanding of this war in the 15th century. Um, and, uh, and this is based on how the Chronicle of Onin has been rewritten. Um, and what's, what's quite interesting is, is that the oldest versions of this tale are very different from the popular later versions. Um, and the oldest ones, they lead off with a prophecy by, there was a monk um, named Baoji, which you can see this remarkable statue of him right here. Um, and he uh, wrote a poem called the Yamataishi. Um, and this, this poem provided the conceptual framework for the Chronicle of Onin. Um, and it's, um, and here you can see someone who's writing it. And for those of you who, who want to look at the Asian languages, usually you might read something in this order, but this is the order in which the text has to be read. So it, it's very much sort of a puzzle. And it describes fairly standard portents of doom. We have comets blazing from the heavens. Here's another example you see of, of that happening at Hastings. Um, and some examples that appear in the prophecy are fairly opaque. So you have this idea that um, a dog and a monkey would fight for hegemony. Um, and this, this idea of the decay of social order, uh, this gekokujo, which I talked about, um, was exemplified when rats would be eating the innards of cows. Um, and uh, um, and so, so th those are sort of the elements of the prophecy. Um, but what's interesting is that this prophecy was, was cut out of later histories, which meant that the, the structure of the tale becomes incomprehensible. Um, and so, so um, why that is, is because certain figures were associated with cows and rats and everything else. And so the whole tale is, is really sort of meant to be sort of a, uh, a description of how this particular prophecy came to fruition. Um, and, uh, and so, you, and what, what happens though, is if you look at some of the later versions, and here's just a, a printing of that, is that the prophecy became old. And so by the time of the 17th century, um, it was cut out entirely uh, of the text. So, so texts that are printed between 1620 and 1640, for example, don't have the prophecy. Um, and uh, as a result of that, uh, a lot of these connections are, are really not, not so known. Uh, and so, uh, and, 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 but the, why this matters actually, is because I just showed you those earlier figures, the Hosokawa and the Yamana. One person was associated with a dog, one person was associated with a monkey, 
So the prophecy being the war will be end when the dog triumphs over the monkey. Um, that happened in 1473 because the one general lived, the dog general outlasted the monkey general by one month. And so the, the tale ends very artificially really at that moment of time to show that the prophecy has been fulfilled. Um, and so that's really why the tale ends, and that's why it doesn't keep on showing and explaining what's happened during the last four years of, of, of the war. Um, and, and really, I'd say that, that because this prophecy became less interesting to audience, it was downplayed and removed. Um, and then uh, basically, I'd, I'd say that, that once it's remitted entirely, then the text is a history of the war really doesn't make any sense, because the people it highlights were not the key protagonists in the war, and the moment it ends is not the end of the war. Uh, and so, so I would really argue that, that in terms of, of historical analysis, this change in the text has, has, has caused the 15th century to be fundamentally uh, um, misunderstood. Uh, and the one thing that's, that's interesting, though, is that, and here's the omission of that prophecy, is that the term gekokujo, which is called the uh, or lower overcoming the higher, was one of those key prophetic terms. Um, and it lingered in the narrative uh, long after the original prophecy was, was removed. Um, and actually, in most historical accounts, this, this term gekokujo came to perceive as, as being represented a new sense of, of conflict, of status or class conflict um, that underpin, underpinned the turmoil of that age. Um, it's so once it's, it's linked to the prophecy and the peculiar sign of, of rats eating the innards of oxen was forgotten, and instead it was taken to be the central historical trope of the 15th century. Thus, more than the text of the Chronicle of Owning, its constituent prophetic tropes continue to shape understandings of the past. Although the Yamataishi and the prophecy was removed from the Chronicle of Onin, uh, its uh, prophecies continue to gnaw at historical and literary narratives to this day. So that's where I, I like to end right there. So thank you for your, for your attention and uh, there. Thank you. And um, so the floor is open for questions. Remember, just use your raise hand button um, and um, jump right in. You can also use the chat um, if, you, if you prefer for some reason. Um, yes, uh, Michael Pearson, go ahead. Hi, hello, yes. Um, so in the Taiheiki, um, there was the warrior, I don't know how to pronounce his name properly, uh, Kuzunoki or something like yes, that. Um, so the opinion, like the general, I guess, public opinion of him being sort of seen as a demon shifting to being celebrated, like mm -hmm. how did that happen over time? And do you think that corresponded with like a change in society in terms of like religious beliefs that people held or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a, good, that's a great question. I mean, actually, I do believe that um, this did change over time so that by the, the 14th century still the Buddhist beliefs were very much dominant. Um, you do see by the turn of the 16th century, there's the rise of um, more of an exclusive, exclusive focus on like Japan's native deities, that's the so-called Shinto. Um, and you actually see sort of much more hostility toward, toward Buddhism in some quarters. Some major temples are burned down at this time. And so I think that kind of gave space for a read to go beyond the, the Buddhist read. Um, and it could be linked to the new belief system, but also there's an overriding sense of the importance of loyalty. So you have one general, for example, said burn the temple. Um, and it, in the 14th, sorry, in the, in the early 15th century, one of the Ashkara shoguns wanted to burn down this one temple because it was a, a real pain and a real thorn in his side. And he ordered the warriors to, to burn down the temple and they just ran away and refused to do so. But by the time you got to around 1570, a general said to the, ordered his warriors to burn down that very same temple and they followed and just destroyed the whole thing. So there seems to be, a, you're right, that there seems to be a change in beliefs there. And that's what allows this Kusunoki, his loyalty to become something which is far more praised than this idea that his sort of clinging to the world makes him a vengeful spirit. So it is, it is a real shift, yes. I have a, a question from James Volko in the, in the chat. Are there any variant witnesses of the first text or is it necessary to reconstruct its prior contents from exterior sources? Uh, I think asking about where, where, we, where you have the information about what is omitted um, from the earliest text. 
for the well for the um uh so what's kind of interesting for the taiheiki actually um is that we don't have any of the earliest so so the only way we know something was omitted from the earliest versions of the taiheiki is that when people criticize something that's no longer extent in the text uh we have one volume from the 14th century and most of the other good copies date from the 16th century. So, um, and for example, that volume 22 that, that Hosokawa Yoyuki just hated, um, there's, there's, we cannot reconstruct that at all. We just know that that volume's missing. And that's how you date old versions of the, of the Taiheiki because always volume 21 is not there. And then later on, it shows up because they just renumber things. Um, the other thing for omissions is there are other texts and there are a lot of other documents. So like you can, track the dating, when did battles happen, when did people switch sides, and that it's very easy to see how accurate the Taiheiki is or not, and it's always very off in terms of dates. There are other chronicles that are far less famous that it can be very precise, so, so that's a real difference there. Um, and for the Chronicle of Owning, that one is even more difficult because we just have figured out that it was written around 1500. It used to be thought of as being an eyewitness account, um, and it seems to have been written a generation after the war, and our earliest texts are still, I would say, I think date from uh, if memory serves, it's, it's much later in the 16th century. So, so it can be very difficult and you have to rely on other sources to understand that. I, I hope I answered that, but if, if, if anyone wants to ask more, I'd be happy to explain a bit more. Jerry, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thank, thank you so much for you know, introducing us to this material we don't know, and you know, special thanks for the very weird what Baoji statue. Um, a question you you said in the I think it was in the 18th century. You know, nobody can read the whole Taiki, but there are certain episodes that are read over and over again that are very popular. So, if you will, like the you know the greatest hits of, of Taiki. In a Western tradition, one would expect that these would be commonplace and that there would be abridged editions, perhaps, um, with the, the high points so that, that you read the, the important or the good parts. Is there anything comparable or, or do you just have full edition after full edition that, that people aren't really reading? Um, so are, are there digests of, of the book that become popular? That's a great, that's a great question. There, there, are, there are digests, yes, um, of, of this. Um, it's also incorporated, certain tropes are incorporated into popular histories. But one thing I, I probably didn't do a good job of explaining is that this, this process in the 18th century of reading the Taiheiki was one where actually you'd have this, this group, these groups of professional Taiheiki readers who would have the whole text and they would then, there'd be an audience and they would pick a certain scene and they'd, they'd narrate it in that sense. So, so that was sort of what, what, how that would work. In terms of the older text, major religious institutions and some of these major warrior families would have their own version. And what's interesting, if you compare them, so like I talked about the Hosokawa family, they have their own copy of the Taiheiki. And if you read it, you can see where they would add in the Hosokawa a lot, you know what I mean? So, so they, they, they would also alter specific versions, but, but really the, more than the, the, the idea of having the written or printed bridge text, I would say that for the 18th century is that people would just all listen to this as, as a popular, almost like a play. That's, that's how the Taiheiki was mostly disseminated. Uh, and and so those readings would happen in the noble households. Um, I mean, so what was access to the text, if you will, class based or or it it would be very wide. So it wasn't just the noble houses. It was it actually became very popular among commoners, people in the cities, um, in the countryside. And so this would be these people would travel into cities and throughout, and they would read these texts. So mm -hmm. so that explains why actually these like this Kusunoki Masashiki becomes someone who's well known throughout all strata society. So that when we see the creation of like more national histories, then he's very prominent. And and I think that's why you also see a lot of the resistance from even the professional historians who knew that this was a problematic text, but they couldn't jettison it because they were so attached to this as being like the great text. So that's why they would still include it in, in their, their uh, you know, fairly dry compilations. And one, one last follow-up question, then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Um, I mean, is this phenomenon of oral readings of, of text to groups um, restricted to, to the Taiki or, or is this a, 
this is a question out of ignorance. Is this a more general way of of, of promulgating um, major texts in, in, let's say, the 18th century? And do we know when those kinds of public readings began and and when they they peter out and and move instead to private silent reading? Oh, that's um, that's a great question. So I would say, actually. The most famous example is there's another tale called the Tale of the Heike, which is probably even more important than the Tai Heike. And it was an oral tale by blind monks on, and so this was something, so it was first spoken orally, which in the 14th century became written down, but you'd still have that performed. So, so the, the idea of sort of the performance of reading these great war tales was something that was there and the Taiheke is different because it was very much sort of a written text, which by the time of the 18th century, you have readers that are sort of kind of mimicking that very older different style. So even though the lineage of these, these texts and how they're created are very different, you still have this, this general um, um, the notion of listening to these great tales. And the tale of the Heike and the Taiheke were both popular. And I would say that that really remains through even the early 20th century, you still had some, some uh, people that would still be chanting these kind of tales, okay. though, though after the 19th century it really dropped off a lot. Okay, Thank, thanks so much. Thank you. And David Spafford. Hi, Tom, how are you doing? David, you got, how are you? you? Um, I, have a, I have a question about the issue of, of the, the emergence of loyalty as, as this, this really, uh, this 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 value that seems to trump all others by the early modern period, right? And and I was I've been you know I've been teaching Taiheiki recently, and today we read Chushingura, and you know so you get the idea. Um, and and I've you know I've always the way I've always structured the the, the trajectory of the emergence of loyalty as this uh, as this supreme value among warriors is I start with Heike, then I go to Taiheiki, and, and indeed I focus on Kusunoki Masashige, whose, whose prior, primary marker of value to the story seems to be his blind loyalty, putting aside how he ends up after he's reborn multiple times as a Tengu. His first appearance, right, is when, is when Godaigo sort of sees, it, sees him in a very unsubtle prophetic dream, uh, and he shows up, right, saying, I will, I will join you no matter, without considering whether this is to my advantage or disadvantage, right? Just call me and I'll be there. And, and, and he goes on to prove his, 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 his value to, to, to the emperor over and over. Um, and, and so I often see Tai Heike as marking a kind of departure from the tale of the Heike mm -hmm. uh, and from previous texts, like, for instance, the Mongol scrolls. Uh, and then we get to the Tokugawa period where the kind of, loyalty that, that Kusunoki Masashige seems to embody towards, in the case of Kusunoki Masashige, it's being embodied, you know, his loyalty is directed at the emperor, right? And by the time we get to the Edo period, it is now being redirected at the local liege lords, the daimyo, the, the regional uh, rulers of the country. Uh, but it seems to be made of the same stuff as Kusunoki Masashige's. And so my question here has to do with the, the point that you raised, which to me was really interesting, of the ways in which Kusunoki Masashige's figure as a literary figure and as a historical figure is transformed in the Edo period when he becomes extremely popular in, in the course of the, the larger diffusion of the text, right? Having, having been at first perhaps an outlaw, a rebel, he now he, he goes on to become a somewhat of a, of a paragon of virtue. And, and so I'm interested in what if you, I'd love you to hear you say a little bit more perhaps about the kind of chicken and egg question here. In other words, did he, does Kusunoki Masashige suddenly become popular because, because loyalty has emerged as an absolute value in the meantime? Or, in, or does he also serve in some ways as, as a vehicle for, for the propagation of this, of this ultimate value? Right? Does he conveniently embody it in a way that allows perhaps for the dissemination and articulation of a value that perhaps hadn't been uh, fully construed in moral terms until then. Uh, you know, Nobunaga, you, you cite the Nobunaga example now here, but you know, yeah, certainly loyalty must have figured there, but it's not usually told as a story of loyalty, right? So I'm wondering what your take is about here, precisely the relationship of the text and the value and how the dif dissemination of the text seems to coincide with the dissemination of the value. That's a great, but there's a, there's a lot there. So yeah, probably just to say that I wasn't, when I'm like talking about the people 
following orders to burn out the temple. Of course, I think the no, key yeah. point is not the ultimate thing is that people will actually follow orders, which is something fairly remarkable in Japan, Japanese history. It takes a long time for that to happen. Um, but it's still, so one thing about the Taiheiki, maybe coming back to when do we start to see this, is that, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right that there is another strand of, of the Taiheiki, and that is one which actually does emphasize the importance of loyalty to the emperor. So, so remember how I sort of brought up the three figures in the Taiheiki. And so actually what's confusing about the creation of this text is that, a, do you remember, it's like I, I kind of highlighted the difference between the two Ashikaga brothers, the giving guy and the lawgiver. But there's another tension in that this text was actually first written by partisans for the Southern court, for Godaigo. And they very clearly had a very different view of loyalty. And they very clearly had a sense that the emperor should give orders and people must obey. And so I think that that's, and that was the original strand that the Ashikaga react against. Um, but I also think that's why Kusunoki is brought up. Um, and, and you see, even for Southern court generals, they will be very critical of a lot of warriors for not showing adequate loyalty. So, so again, what's interesting is those people that are trying to hold people up to higher standards, the Southern court, and it just, they're not successful. Um, they demand you must follow my orders. These people don't. Then Takuji just says, I'll compensate you, and he's much more popular. So, so I would say as long as the Ashikaga are, are fairly powerful, that this, this idea of the real strong notion of loyalty doesn't really, doesn't really sort of resonate. Um, and I would say it's in the 16th century, the implosion of the Ashikaga, when they, they, they don't disappear until 1573, but effectively by 1500, they cease to be a functioning entity. Uh, most of the time. Um, and so in that aftermath, that, that's where you start seeing people start bringing up um, figures that are opposed to the Ashikaga as exemplars. So it can be, and, and that's where some people will focus on a different warrior lineage, the Taira, some people focus on other things. And so it's used in that sense. Um, and no one has really looked as much as why Kusunoki Masashige comes in, because I find it's very interesting. It's in the 1550s, and it's by people who were, it's the Miyoshi's partisans are the ones that are pushing this. And they are ones which burned down Todaiji. So they actually have a fairly strong anti-Buddhist take. So, so I find it's kind of interesting why it's happening then. And we don't have as much reference to how this thing is being read until a little bit later. But the first time when, when he was pardoned by the court is really, is really in the 15, I think it's like, what did I say, 1557, something like that. I, I, I forgot the exact date. Um, and so I think that that's where you're seeing that change toward more loyalties over the course of the 16th century as all those things are shifting, but it's kind of a messy thing. And then it's really the Tokugawa with the reading that it all becomes very much formalized, if that, if that makes sense. Um, did I answer everything? Is there more? Okay, thank you. Let's go to Paula Curtis. Hey, hi, Tom. How's it going? Paula, how <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that I found out this event was happening and I'm happy to have uh, joined everyone. This might be a, a selfish question on my part because you know that I work on medieval forgeries, but going back to what you talked about at the very beginning of the talk, I'm wondering about the language surrounding the alterations of this text and whether or not this sort of reimagining of the text or the editing of the text, the conscious omissions of the text are talked about and criticized. And if they are, is the language that's used to talk about this kind of falsification, something that's centered on sort of the editing of the story and the history or the editing of the text itself? Most of the early critiques are actually on the accuracy of the text. And so these are by participants, their sons or grandsons who are saying those people weren't there, this person was more important, you forgot this person, what have you. So, so most of those are at the level of what I would call factual basis. And if you actually look at the historians like Kume Kumitake, when he's doing in the 19th century, he's actually verifying from other records. And that's why he's saying the Taiheiki is absolutely worthless. Because if you look very carefully at all the other sources, you can see it's always off. So, so I would say that that's sort of one, one first level of critique really is, is, is that. Um, and then in terms of the, the creation and re-editing re of these texts, um, we don't know a whole lot. So people don't talk about that. Instead, the complete versions we have mostly date from the 16th century. And if you look very carefully, I've always, I mean, I've, I've read this thing through a couple of times. And 
I, I think this would be something that would deserve a lot more sort of uh, analysis of word usage. Because to me, I clearly see it in three different sections. That the first section is kind of what I saw with David says, it's much more of a, a Godaigo partisan loyalty. That, that's, that's very strong in the first third. The second part is a bit of a jumble. Um, and the third part gets very specific, very detailed. The language is very different. Um, and so I really think that we, we know there are probably at least six authors, but I feel it's really in three distinct sections um, in a lot of ways. But no one has really looked as much into how we can know how this changed over time, because we're basically looking at texts that were, were copied in. Uh, I think the Hostakawa one dates from the 15th century to the to early 16th century. Um, so it's very difficult. The other thing, which once you get surviving copies of the text, you can compare. Um, and that's where also it gets interesting in that if you look at the old text from like the 1500s, um, they treat the Ashikaga fairly neutrally. But if you look at the text written the Tokugawa period, so in the 18th century, the titles change and they become much more negative for the Ashikaga. So you can do that textual transmission if you want to compare stuff from say the 1550s to the 19th century. You can see uh, the movement toward loyalty, the movement toward the Ashikaga become villains. This idea of the Basara becomes much more negative. So you can trace that. But that earlier part, we just don't have the, the text to, to do that kind of analysis, but I'm sure something like that also happened. But we do know by 1370, it basically stabilized. Um, and that's where there's no change in the number of volumes and always 21's missing and all that. So, so I'd say that it, it's sort of stabilization was relatively early and it seems to have been relatively consistent, but that's just conjecture on my part. A couple of questions in the chat. Um from Mihoko Suzuki. Can you discuss the contemporary post-World War II reception of Oninki? And a somewhat similar question from Charles Rocket, um, who wondered, who does it benefit in the modern era for the Taheki to recast the villains as heroes? Good. Uh, so let me ask for, for, for the Taiheiki, who did it matter for? I, I would actually say that the recasting of the villains as heroes uh, was at the same time, the heroes, the Ashikaga became the great villains um, because now all the key parameter is loyal to the emperor or not. So the Ashikaga become rebels against the throne. And actually there's statues I showed you in the, the 1860s were decapitated by, by imperial loyalists who felt that they were traitors. Um, and at the same time, then the ones that showed us loyalty were thought to be the great heroes. And this really continued through, through the Second World War. So, so it was part of that process of, I think, nation state that you must have one emperor and be devoted to that emperor and all that. And that's that process which picked up on these earlier trends and made them much stronger. Um, after, after the um, uh, World War II for the Taiheiki, that loyalty thing kind of faded, but just by default, the basic narrative of the Taiheiki, some of the figures are still well known, you know, um, but, but it's, it, it's it, that's, that's, there's not a whole lot, I'd say that's changed there. Um, in, in terms of the, the uh, Oninki, uh, again, Onin is always famous for being just like a completely difficult um, uh, tale, difficult thing to understand. There was a popular show um, about the, the, the called, uh, basically it was called Hana no Ran, which is about the Oni thing. And it was, it had the worst ratings uh, of any, any of these historical dramas until much more recent ones, because there were no good people. You know what I mean? There were like no good, even I think the, the, the Oni key, it's like, you don't have any character who is laudatory in any way. So it's a much more depressing tale uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but there has been very recently some sort of, um, I'd say that some histories of, of the Onin War that don't rely on the Onin Ki have become like bestsellers in Japan. So it's kind of, now it's having its own interesting moment, uh, I would say, and there's been some very good research regarding that. But again, the, the, the impression is people are still bound by that tale, which doesn't make sense because it covers a 10 year war, it just covers six years and it ends without any resolution. And so I think because of that, people don't even know who were the major protagonists and antagonists in the war. And that's where the confusion is so great. Um, it just, it, it's, it's so skewed that the war as portrayed in this narrative doesn't make any sense. And 
really historians haven't gone beyond that. So it just remains a, a very chaotic time. That's in, in everyone's memory and understanding. Um, I think that's all. Well, Peter couldn't be with us today. So when he's not here, one of us often tries to guess what he would ask. And I think he would, it's much of what you've been talking about, the omissions, sounds like it's, it's really about comparing different um, copies, different exemplars of this basic text through the years. And I think, you know, Peter's so interested in censorship, he would wonder if I'm channeling him properly, are there, are there copies that are marked up, cross out, rewritten commentaries, you know, in the margins on specific copies of these texts? Or is it mainly between copies comparing variation in the way you were just um, talking about in response to Paula's question? So in, in, that's, that's a good question. I mean, some of the oldest copies um, in certain warrior households will have additions of their relatives. You can see that. Um, but what I find interesting in terms of like censorship, I mean, um, yeah, if you look at, if you look at each individual old text, you will see considerable variation. It's generally the critic, the parts that have been criticized are very public and whatever they criticize has been erased. So in some ways, what's interesting about the Taiheke is it's an example where censorship was effective because the number of initial texts was so small that that you know the, the first rewriting the Tadayoshi demanded, um, we don't have that initial variant. And then the one thing that Yoriyuki burned, I mean, he, there's, there's absolutely no sense of what possibly he could have talked about. So, so that that's, is kind of an interesting thing of, of the censorship involved burning, which was final in, in this text. And you don't have this, this variant. Um, and then when we get the differences, it's more, it tends to be where it's not criticism, but various warriors will put their ancestors in episodes. So there tends to be a process of expanding where people will add their relatives. And so you get variations about that. But, but the, interestingly enough, you don't see um, some changes in, in the text. I mean, and again, the, the one warrior that's in Magawa Yoshin, his, his, he wrote a text called the, My Criticism of the Taiheki. So, so that's something that, that is kind of unusual. And that's actually the oldest sense of the text. You see what I mean? And so do you say, is he criticizing it or is he already representing an attempt by an outsider to basically censor it by demanding that these things be changed and they all were? I, I, I don't know, but that's, that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jerry, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, um, and again, question out of, of ignorance because the material is, is so foreign to us. When you talk about the warrior families adding bits about their own families, are we talking about a manuscript context? Or are we talking about additions made to print editions? Do, do manuscript and print editions kind of coincide through history or I mean, when, when does it move from manuscript to print? And, and again, what's the mechanism of, of families adding their own stories to, um, to the narrative? So that's great. So, so yes, yeah, so they, originally they're all manuscript copies. So I would say that all the oldest ones, um, all the oldest versions that we have from you know 15th century and all that, they're all written manuscript copies. And so as they're copying it, the copyist would just seamlessly in the narrative just add names. So you, you don't really get the sense that it looks like an addition, uh, you know, like something was amended. It's just added. And, and that's where we see, see that variation. Um, and then what we have is um, the really the, the textual printing is not something you see until basically the 17th century. Um, and that's, I'd say, you know, in the 1620s, 30s, you have a lot of these works that are then printed. Um, and I talked a little bit about the own inky, but it's the same as the Taiheki. That's the moment when it's called, it's like the standard text is created. Um, and that is one where actually it's, it's, it's an amalgamation of these different manuscripts and it, it's subtly different. Um, but then after, there's such interest in the Taiheki that actually even, even in the 18th, 19th, sorry, the ninth, yeah, 18th, 19th century, you actually have a printed version, which is printed, uh, it's, it's a comparison of all the like seven or eight manuscripts of the oldest ones. So the, you can imagine it's one, it's one giant set that has eight, eight manuscript copies of this 40 volume text. 
And every time there's a difference, it will show this text says this, this text says this and all that. So, so you actually have that printed. Um, and so the movement to print culture is really a 17th, 18th, um, 19th century thing. You don't, see, you don't see that happening earlier, but then that becomes dominant. And so when these Taiheke readers are doing that, it's all from a printed text basically that they're doing. So the manuscript text would have been too valuable and they would have been controlled by mostly these great warrior houses and have been their, their sort of very valuable property. So they would not have been readily shown to people. It was more for internal consumption. Okay, great. So then the, the manuscript, the, the, rather the public readers are not going to um, alter their performance to the, the region where they are, the, you know, the families that are prominent in, in, no. in the area. They won't, and, and actually some of the families, like the one the Hosokawa family remained prominent even in the 18th century. So you could get in real trouble if you tried to change something because they would listen. And so if you cut them out or added them or the critical of something, yeah, it, it would cause problems, I'd say, even at that time. Thank you. Lynn, go ahead. Hi, thank you. This was fascinating. I was wondering, is this text ever illustrated? And if so, when does that first happen? Uh, so the, the Taiheke is illustrated. Oh, um, it's in the early modern. So it's, I believe, I believe it's an 18th century um, case where we have it. We don't have an old version, but we do have illustrated Taiheke. And, and, and actually there's a number of different um, uh, manuscripts, uh, very late ones from that time, where we have some illustrations, but there's one very beautiful, completely illustrated set, but, but there's nothing earlier. Um, it's all, I'd say, a, a product of the print culture. So after you have the print culture, that's when you see then these very nice, but the illustrated versions are all written in hand and you have like each volume, there's one image and, 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 and it's, 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 those are not printed. Um, and I know of one really good version, but I'm sure there are others as well. Uh, the Chronicle of Owning is too much of a mess and it's too short. And so I don't know of any illustrated versions of that. And it's like, that's not something people, it's like, oh, they destroyed the Capitol, ruined everything. Let's have pictures. Um, you, you, you don't have a whole lot of that at all for that one. Thank you. John, did you want to? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll just, um, thanks, Tom. This is really fantastic. Just these are other follow-ups, I guess, um, uh, to the discussion we're just having. Um, I am curious, sort of as Jerry is, about these 16th century, maybe early 17th century, you know, creations of the book um, and editorial processes um, that, sound like obviously they're mm, well they sound they sound pretty crucial to the to the story here and I wonder how if you can talk more about you know that work though it's you know work of later readers it sounds pretty you know pretty in terms of creating the text that we have pretty vital um, and how much we know about if we want if we even want to call them editors or publishers or family, historians you know I guess I'm just trying to get a better handle on who controls the books um, in you know in in those in what I would call the early modern era there to to make the text that we have though what you just said about the the, the com comparative edition where you can actually see multiple versions side by side is fascinating too mm -hmm. and so, you know and who, who's who's doing who's behind doing that and to what end that's just one thing I and then another thing I, I and I feel like this is picking up a bit of a thread on the in the chat the the business about the prophetic frame on the and the oninki I guess it is and and why it disappears it sounds like you were saying that prophecy is a key to reading the text and that it may have been meant to be explicated as a, you know, as a prophecy fulfilled or something, but once the prophetic frame is excised, it doesn't make any sense. Is that where you're, saying? and I'm just curious what, you know, um, that, that, that's, that's interesting and, you know, could makes I, you know, again, who would, who, you know, who's responsible for, uh, you know, that frame or the elimination of it. So any thoughts on sort of the creations of these books in later era? Thanks. Mm 
That's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great topic to think about in a lot of ways. I mean, so generally one thing is, is that Japan after at the beginning of the um, 17th century undergoes a profound transformation that warriors are separated from peasants. Warriors have to reside in castle towns. They become like the officials and they become sort of scholars as well. And so these are the people that would then be able to, through connections, to get access to some of these texts because of major lords. And then they would work on creating these, these, these various printed versions. Um, and in some ways, I think that it's my, I, I haven't, I'm only familiar with the one very famous printed version of the Taiheki. So what's very interesting about the Taiheki is you have all this textual variation and then you get one standard disseminated text. And, and why you don't have a lot of competing versions, to my knowledge, is interesting. You know what I mean? And, and so um, it's, it was just, you, the blocks were done in the 1620s, 1630s, and it was just done well enough. And it was critical enough, the Ashkaga that became widely popular. And from my knowledge is I haven't seen a lot of differences. So, so for example, this, this version I have here is 18th century. And this is actually that standard, this, it's the same standard printing as you would get of, of like almost every text of it. And there's actually a monograph of a doctor. Um, and so one of the, I could see if I could get this. Hold on, Tom, I, well, you have to trust me on it, but, um, and, and so, and that it means that a lot of these warriors would have it, would disseminate it. And so I would say it's very much of, of, of this order doing that. And so we do know in certain, domains, people that are employed for these great lords, their job will be to, to sort of come up with these texts and print them. Um, and, and I'd say that actually the owning one is better because you actually have a lot of variation. So you can actually see how quickly it changes in that the early, very early, some late 15th, early 16th century versions have the prophecy. It leads off with that whole weird poetic prophecy. And the, then you have, uh, there's a version in the 1620s, which comes in, which is the first printed version, which is a two volume version. And that one, we actually, they refer to as the prophecy says, and then it just goes into the narrative. And then by the 16, just a decade later, you get that's cut out and they just ignore it entirely. So you can see it's really looks like over a couple of decades of the 17th century where we can see that that change happening. Um, and it just, it, it to me deserves further research and there might be very rare, Printed variants of the Taiheki that'd be worthwhile to to sort of look at as well. Um, and as far as the Taiheki, what we know is that that version was so well known that then later on various wars would say, well, our textual version is better, and that's where they would print out that version. Whereas for the Chronicle of Onin, you don't you don't really see that. If anything, that was just a much smaller text, and so it was not so popular. And I think that that difference of attention explains why you can maybe see the variations, but then it stops, whereas the Taiheke, they keep printing more and more and more and more. So, so no one talks about like the Chronicle of Onin as if it is, it sums up the age, like they did for Taiheke. So the texts are very different in that sense. Yeah, there's a question that Kevin just posed in the chat about who, you know, who edited the Taiheke and what was their background? And I, I guess it is, if, uh, you know, as someone who obviously works on Western materials, is the, the lack of knowledge we have about editors, for want of a better word, mm -hmm. or the people involved in the creation of the text mm -hmm. in those moments, um, and what their agenda was, as Kevin is asking, is, is you know, it's intriguing, and it sounds like it's a little frustrating that we, you know, you might be able to hypothesize a region or a or a place, but it's really hard to name names or get a sense of the mechanics of the editing process. Right. A lot of what we'll have is we'll have a text that hopefully we can date. We'll have the name of the editor in if it, if in the, the French printing blocks. So we'll know where it was published, who edited it. And then if you look at other records, you could sometimes find it's generally this was a, a warrior scholar in one of these domains. So there's, that's what they would just do, be working on these texts like that. But but um, so we we in certain cases we can reconstruct some things um, about about these figures. Um, I would, but in a lot of cases, their I, ideals, their agendas, it's not so well known because they weren't so famous as to leave a lot of other works. We just know that this was the editor, and we could just compare the differences of the printed version. But 
because you have more, I mean, I do think this would be a very good topic for someone to, to look into because you might be able to, you know, I mean, the key moment of printing and editing and formulating these things is really a couple of decades in the 17th century. Um, and then that's why I especially think like this erasure, the prophecy that you can see it's happening within a generation. So all the older references to it, it's very strong. And so when I'm talking about, well, this just changed. It's really, it's very neat in, in terms of the printed versions. And you could just see, you know, all prophecy, we could prophecy, no prophecy between 1610, 2030. Um, and I, I'm not as familiar with Taiheke about those gradations because I've only looked, I've mostly looked at the manuscript copies. I haven't paid as much attention to the differences of the printed copies of the Taiheke, to be, to be frank. I think Julie Davis had a question or two. Hi, Tom. Nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you, Julie. Hey, um, so here we've drifted into printed culture in the 18th century. So you knew that was going to get me all excited to ask you a few questions. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing as an art historian that you don't really run into illustrations of Taiheike in the same way that you run into things like with the Heike, for example. You know, you have to know certain kinds of things as an art historian. And Taiheike is not one of the ones that um, regularly appears. And so I really wanted to follow up with you a little bit about the illustrations, but also to ask you um, what you think of this particular case that I've been thinking about for a long time. I worked on a book by Jipencha Iku called The Bakemono Taiheike. And a few years ago, your library purchased it. And it's an amazing story. It's a, basically a parody of the Ehon Taikoki, which is the story of Hideyoshi, right? The rise of, rise of Hideyoshi. And what's amazing about this Bakemono Taiheiki is it has nothing to do with the Taiheiki at all. It's all about the Taikoki and it's all about turning Nobunaga and, uh, and, Hideyoshi, and Hideyoshi and Ieyasu into uh, a snake. Uh, 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 um, why am I blanking? Of uh, three creatures that are all constantly at war with each other. So my only thought there was that in a way, Tai and, and that book was incidentally banned. It was part of this large scale ban mm -hmm. and censorship that went on with the Bakken, with the whole Ehon Taikoki problem. And then recently, so I've always thought, oh, Taiheki becomes like a code word for infighting or for civil war. And you can do things under the code of Taiheki that you couldn't do otherwise. And then recently in the Tress collection that we just got, we got this manuscript that's called the Kaon Taiheiki um, that um, Peter Kornitsky has written about. And it has to do with an attempted uh, uprising that was then quashed. And so maybe this is an easy question for you, Tom, but what do you think about this idea of the Taiheiki becoming like code for, for fighting and, and, and in a way that you can get away with uh, in the censorship codes of the Edo period that you can't get away with, for example, talking about Ieyasu. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, yeah, I think there's a real ambivalence about the Taiheiki in that on one level, because the protagonist, the Ashikaga, and they were, they're increasingly portrayed in a bad light. Yeah, it, you, you are right that the, you can throw out Taiheiki as, I mean, it just means a chronicle pacification in some way. So it could be just a code term for, for, as you say, conflict, pacification, what have you. And so you could link it to that and there'd be two dynamics. One is you link it to Taiheiki, but also Taiheiki is a popular thing. So you're gonna increase the popularity of it um, and what have you, but it, you still sometimes, and what happened though, you mentioned is that this, this uh, Bakimono Taiheiki was still banned because the Tokugawa at one level were very, had no problem with these criticisms, but then sometimes they realized we're the successor to the Ashkaga, so you shouldn't do this. And so they generally let it go for a while, but if it became too extreme, then they would do this. So like when the Ashkaga statue was decapitated, the people got in real trouble because the Tokugawa are like, no, we must, we are the successors to them. So you can only go so far, so far with that. Um, so, so generally I'd say that there, you have some freedom, but within bounds. And, and, and as I had to, to Jeremy, when I mentioned about like the, when people are talking, like I said, you, you didn't want to say certain things to upset someone. There's only one, one really family, one family that would, you get in trouble and that's the Hosokawa family because they've survived this whole mess. And so the one case where we have an illustrated Taiheiki that I know of that's really good, it's located of course in Kumamoto. 
because the Hosokawa, that was like their thing. And so I believe it's part of Eisei Bunko, but I'm not positive. Um, but there is, but if that's why they, if anyone was going to illustrate the Taiheiki, it'd be someone with Hosokawa funds because they, they were the ones who were very famously glorified. Because again, it ends with Hosokawa Yoriyuki saying, everything's at peace and, and, and everything's great. So the Hosokawa love that text like no other. Um, so that's how, how that fits in. Does that kind of answer? Or there's just I mean, it's, it's so you know? interesting, you know, because I think part of, I mean, my theory about why the Bakemono Taiheki was such a problem was it was just simply so rude. I mean, it was just, you know, they, um, you know, turned Hideyoshi into a snake and um, they turned Nobunaga into a slug and the snake has to travel up someone's back passage to steal their precious treasure. And so, you know, instead of stealing a sword, so it becomes this whole big problem. But I wanted to follow up with you. I mean, I know people were asking about the editing of the printed volume. Do you know who controlled the, was that printed through the Jisha Bugio? The, the, um, or do you think, I don't think that would be a, a which means the, um, magistrate of, of shrines and temples, not the city magistrate, because I'm trying to understand who's controlling the history here on a larger scale level. I think, um, I think that these aren't officially controlled, even these other versions. So these are scholars that are doing it, but they're working with other publishers. And so I don't believe that the, in these printing, that it really has like the official imprint, even though it's done with the tacit approval of a lot of these these daimyo and other figures. You know what I mean? I don't, but I don't think it would go through printed through official channels in that sense. I think they would go through private publishing houses in the cities, but they would have to be connected with someone to get access to the text to do all these things. But that's something I'm I need to know more, particularly for the Taiheiki. I actually that's something I, I really should look into more, I think, because I I think more could be known. I just I'm not sure about that. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead, Dave. Oh thanks. Um Julie, is it possible simply that that uh, the Bakemono Taiheiki is using Taiheiki in as much as Taiheiki is also shorthand for the 14th century, which by the end of the period has become the, the safe place to talk about politics without talking about contemporary politics. I mean, again, having just read Chingura today, right? Where yeah. everything is displaced from 1703 to the, to the 13, whatever, 40s, 50s, whenever exactly it takes place, right? Uh, I'm wondering whether, whether, whether in this sense, what the title is shorthand for is less the meaning of the title than the general context, which is associated with Taiheiki as a kind of safe space for talking about vaguely political things in ways that are not threatening, directly threatening to the regime. Although as Tom said, you know, it's just so far you can go safely. It is probably something like that where you just shift the time zone into another time zone, just as they do with Chushin Gurda. And then, but then anybody who would open it up would know that this was a story of Hideyoshi. So um, it's just, yes. I mean, it's just that kind of Edo, like, ha, 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 look over here. Um, pay yeah. attention to what we're doing over here kind of thing that they do over and over again. I, I agree. And what David mentioned even is the Chushin Gura, it's, it's Kono Marunao, it, that's Takuji's right-hand man. And he was like portrayed in the Taheki's Basara. So he's, he's the perfect example, one who becomes much more of a villain. And he's, he's the perfect one where you can use him as a negative character in any way. But yeah, you're exactly right that there's a displacement. And so like, if you use the 14th century and, and link people to, to the Basara people or slugs, that's one thing, but you don't want to push the Ashikaga too far. I guess that's where, that's how that kind of, kind of fits in there. But yeah, I think it's exactly right. You know, when you, when you, um, you were talking about how one text of the Taiheki becomes dominant in the print period, um, I just was thinking as a, as a scholar of, uh, you know, European, Western European print, um, uh, one of Elizabeth Eisenstein's big theories, which has been heavily criticized, you know, was, was about the so-called fixity of print. And it just seems to me that there's a, there's more comparative work that could be done on this question through the comparison of, of movable type and woodblock printing, because of course it's a much bigger job. To, you said, you know, well, they had good blocks for this and they just, they had a good set of blocks and they printed from it. It's much harder to cut 
new a new woodblock book. Now I'm sure you could. I mean, uh, of course, in in Europe, I know you can edit. I assume you can edit woodblocks in the block in various ways. But given that the underlying technology of movable type versus block, woodblock printing, this the the most common technology anyway in each area does involve different logistics, different uh, economies of labor. It seems like a, I'm sure there's work out there, but I'm just not familiar with it. But for a larger scale kind of comparative study of uh, reprinting variation, uh, new editions, new versions, how these kind of, um, how frequent they are, because you held up a, a, a copy of a couple centuries later, I think, um, but that, of course, could be printed from the same blocks that were used to print the the, the earliest printed edition, which is never going to happen with movable type, except in occasional, very rare occasions of you know a, a standing type that's forgotten about for a very long time. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there because uh, there's a lot of non-East Asian specialists here, but it seems to me that this is one area where thinking about the underlying technology could be very productive for for um, conversations, mm -hmm. uh, comparative conversations. Yeah, there, there's a there's a great book by um, uh, Mary Elizabeth Ferry about about the print culture that, that has come out, um, and uh, in Japan. But I do think you're right that, especially I mean, so for example, when you get the Taiheiki, the forty volume work, getting those blocks carved is such a big job. So. And, and so the standard version is known as the Keicho version, which is the 1620s, 30 version. So, and they're carved on cherry, so they wouldn't print it a lot, but you know, what I have is right from that. So, so I think there is, there is something to be said of that it, it does stabilize, especially the very long text <laughs> um, in, in, in ways that uh, uh, does prove durable. I mean, in a lot of my research, what I've found is I'm always battling against the standard version of the Taiheiki, which I find is, is much less interesting than these early manuscript copies, which are very different in, in some ways. But most historians just look at that standard version and that's the most accessible copy. So, so I do think that a lot of the studies of the Taiheiki have been very much uh, to, the, to the detriment of 14th century Japan and, and that have, have been really sort of wed to this one, this one text in a lot of ways. Um, and so looking at the variations is, is important. And ironically, we do have that printed, it's called the Sanko Taiheiki, which is like the, the Taiheiki reference work or something, which has all those other, other versions, but it's, it's, very, it's very slow going. You can imagine reading seven, you know, they'll have like seven lines all next to each other with every variation. So it's a very painful thing to do. But that again shows you the importance, um, even within the printed culture of showing this variation in some ways. I can just add something here. I think reprinting wouldn't be that hard because you could take, if you had a nice clean copy, you could simply disbind it and then lay the sheets down on, an, on another block and just carve through the, the carve a new block. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so no, it wouldn't I'm, be that difficult. The, no, the reprinting or doing that's one thing, but then changing it oh. is mm -hmm. that's what I was alluding to. So they could redo the blocks or something. But what I found is I haven't seen the the the, 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 the version of the 17th century is seems to be fairly consistent. Um, and so that that's what I was getting at. Not that you can reuse the blocks, but that not many people go to the trouble to to change passages and all that. They just tend to reprint the thing. Yeah. Um, just clarification, um, that edition you've spoken of with the, the, all the variants, um, when does that date from? Is that a modern critical edition? Um, is it of all 40 volumes of, of the book? Yeah. How many copies of, of, of it are there? I mean, that, I mean it, if it's a modern critical edition, I understand it. If it's something older, that seems to be like running totally counter to everything you're, you're telling us. It's I, I need to um, I need to go through that. I believe it's a early nineteenth century, but I could be wrong. Um, so what I believe is that actually, so from the sixteen thirty, you know, seventeenth, eighteenth century, it's very standard. And by the time we get to the nineteenth century, that's where we have some of the scholars that are, I believe it's linked to where Mito is, that they're the ones 
that also then will have access to these texts and start doing that. I believe, I believe it's it's something that's before the modern period. I, I, I believe that's when it comes out. But that sort of 19th century is a different different moment when you're seeing the scholarship is 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 becoming much more sophisticated and looking at the differences of these texts. You see that with um, with manuscripts. That's very standard in Japan to do this. And what I find interesting is this one later version. So I, it's again looking at the basic the, the, the variations in the manuscripts off from the printed version, if that if that makes sense. So so. Um, uh, uh, but I need to I I'll I need to to look up exactly when when that was I believe I always thought it was like an 1820s to 40s thing but um, I I could be wrong so I'll uh, I'll look at that and let you know how's that but I mean it, it it's not declaring one version of the text the right version everything else weird variants um, I mean is it trying to assemble a, a, a master test text from all of the, the variants? I think, I think it is so that once we, after people are so it, it, the audience for this is one who's internalized the printed version of the text and then it's a way of disseminating all the variations of of basically with the major warrior houses their their particular versions and it'll be all put together um, in, in that way so I think that's that's you know the appeal is um, just because people were so fascinated with the Taiheiki, that with the Taiheiki reading and everything else, they wanted to know more and more and more, uh, and that's where this comes out. And so it's a combination of earlier manuscript studies with this popularization, and that's how these scholars printed this thing out. I mean, it's it actually, I don't know if there's been as much research on this thing lately because like the version I had was printed in the 1930s, you know, because it's just so huge. Um, but it, it does merit more looking into. So I'll. I'll, I'll look into that a bit more and see. So my sense is it's 19th century and I'll, I'll let you know where it is, okay, so. Right. I, I, I mean, is it, is it something that you would find in every major research library or? Yeah, yeah, you would, you would. Okay. It's, um, it's, it's called the Sanko Taiheiki and it's, it should be, um, yeah, you, you should find it. I mean, it was printed commonly through World War II um, and not so much after the war, that's what I'd say. Well we have let's have two rapid fire questions to before we wrap up so maybe linda and julie you could just ask your questions one after the other and then tom you can address them both okay. i have a very easy one tom did anybody ever make manuscript copies of the taiheiki after the printed version i mean you hear about people doing that as a means to for memorization or to have their own private copy when they're not able to afford having a printed copy or something like that. So that was my quick question. Linda? Hi, hey, Tom, thanks. I read the article right away and uh, enjoyed it. But um, you were talking about the, the difficulty of reading the prophecy, the, the kind of the physical difficulty. Do you think that had an impact on the fact that it disappeared so quickly? Uh, great questions, both of these. So. Um, so first, would you, the, the, do we have later copies of the Taiki? Yes, we would. We would. Um, most of the scholars look at the older versions, but still people might be doing that. But they would not copy the printed version. They would copy a manuscript, is what I would say, uh, from there. And um, yeah, Linda, about the uh, the prophecy, it, it is so difficult. Um, it just to the characters are strange. What they're writing is elliptical. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I think that's the that's that's the reason, yeah, for, for that it would be cut out because it just would be too difficult to, to make sense of. And so, as anyone would start to read the tale, they couldn't even read the opening lines. And so I think that might contribute to why that gets edited out. That's one real possibility. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. And um, as usual, when we have talks about um, East Asian manuscript and print culture in this workshop, I always come away feeling like I need to learn a lot more um, about it. Um, but it's one of the pleasures for me of this workshop is um, the, the comparative structure that's been built into it for, for a long time. So I just wanna thank you for the great talk. Thanks everyone for coming and do um, check back in with us next week for, for our finale um, of the semester. And hopefully we'll see, see you in the spring as well. Well, Thanks thank again. You, Tom. Thank you for the great questions and, and uh, really very, very interesting. I really appreciate this opportunity. So thanks so much.